Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining on this edition where we have uh, Jason Costa, product director at Reddit, our one of our favorite platforms to procrastinate and also to lurk on topics that you wouldn't generally do uh, on on the boring old Facebook or LinkedIn. And um, Jason will be speaking about the do's and don'ts of uh, product management. So uh, we've seen the slides before. He has like a um, couple of uh, very fun slides to show you guys. And I think I'll just hand it over to you. If you guys have questions, put them in the chat, either here on Zoom or on YouTube. So I will sync them out for Jason. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the talk. Um, and after the Q&A session, uh, the people who want to stay on Zoom, we can have a, a breakout session, uh, and like a small networking uh, time that is not recorded. Um, so over to you, Jason, now for your talk. Okay. Thank you, Marilla. Thanks for uh, product folks, for product people for having me uh, today. I really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and present my screen. Can everybody see it? Yep. Wonderful. S Cool. So uh, as, as Marilla mentioned, I am Jason Costa and uh, I've been in product for a while now. Um, and I can just share with you uh, some of the places I've been so you can get a little bit of an understanding of my background. I've spent my entire career in consumer. Um, that's, that's really um, the, the space that I like to play in. And I studied computer science as an undergrad. Um, and joined Google. This was back in 2005. Um, and it's kind of amazing to think because at the time, Google was about 3,600 people. Um, and I remember thinking like, wow, this is a really big company. Um, and by the time I left four years later, uh, it, it was 27,000. And my understanding now is the full-time employees are about 4x that. So it's been really amazing to watch that company continue to grow from the sidelines. I was primarily in technical roles there, um, first as a partner engineer, and then later as a technical programs manager. Um, and then I went back to grad school. And when I finished, uh, I joined in early 2011, uh, a little company called Twitter. And I was managing the platform there. Um, so primarily working on uh, our API, um, or suite of APIs rather. And I got to work on that for a couple of years, um, managing a really neat ecosystem of more than a million uh, unique app developers. And then uh, after two years, I decided to make a jump over to Pinterest where I got to be one of the first two product managers on the ads team. Um, and so I got to build that business when we were literally making zero in revenue, we were just burning cash every day and that was uh, early 2013 um, to, to see that scale to uh, well over 100 million in annualized revenue run rate. Um, and then during my time at, at Pinterest, uh, after about two years of working on the ads team, I went and jumped over to lead the pins team there. Um, and if you've ever used Pinterest, pins are effectively, once you click in from the stream, you go into the full bleed image uh, with a lot of additional metadata um, and that's a pin, that's a pin object. And so uh, my team was responsible for the strategy of how we, we render these objects um, and what we include, how we let users engage with them on the service. And then after about a year and a half, uh, I, I made the, the detour into venture for a couple of years. Um, I went to join a, a venture firm that was based out of East Asia. Um, and I was pretty intrigued with what was happening uh, in East Asia because the consumer behavioral patterns as it pertains to software services are pretty different. Um, and so I wanted to go and learn more about how things were unfolding there. And so uh, I spent a bunch of time there. And then after about two years, I just got the itch to go uh, work on product again and really, really wanted to get back to working on a consumer product in particular that I loved and used every day. Um, and so I joined uh, Reddit as a director of product uh, leading the content and communities team. So uh, what does a PM do uh, anyhow? And uh, this is the question I, I've gotten asked quite a bit in my career, which is always a fun one to answer. And I like to first start off talking about what product managers uh, don't do, and then we can get into what they do. Um, but I will tell you before we go further, it's a pretty malleable role. And oftentimes it tilts in certain directions, depending on what I like to say which function or discipline is strongest at an organization. And so I'll give you an example 
uh, of, of what I mean by that. Um, and I'll compare and contrast my experiences at Google. And I did do, when I was at uh, grad school, I did an internship on the product team at Facebook. So I got exposure there for about four months. Um, all of my information is largely dated at this point. I worked at Facebook in 2010, so I'm sure it's evolved quite a bit, but I'll just share with you some of the things that I observed there um, along my journey. So product at Google, at least in the early days, it's very, very different now, um, but product at Google, when I was there, it was heavily tilted toward uh, towards engineering and you really had to be highly technical as a, a PM there. So, you know, when you think back to the product, it was sort of necessitated by the product itself. Uh, there was very little design, right? You typed google.com, this was pre iPhone. You typed google.com into the desktop browser, you went, you got onto the site and you searched for something. And the things that mattered were, what was the time to interact? How performant were the searches? Uh, were the results quality? Did it get you to where you needed to be? So algorithms and data structures and things of that nature were really, really key. And that was where, uh, you know, the, a lot of the bulk of value came from the product role. So at that time, PMs were extremely technical. Uh, they often had a bachelor of science, if not a master's in computer science. And most PMs were actually former engineers. And it was really important uh, at Google at that time to have the respect of engineering. If the engineering team didn't respect you as a product manager, uh, you were you were not set up for success out of the gate. Now, uh, Facebook is different, right? Like it's extremely design and user experience oriented. The entire information architecture uh, of the app and the site was centered around social interactions and your graph of connections to families, uh, to friends, to colleagues, and so on and so forth. And so actually when I was there in 2010, a lot of the PMs were actually former designers and had moved over um, to, to the product world. And so that was an example where uh, the tilt was far more towards uh, the design muscle. And so it was really important that the, the discipline of product have the respect of the design team. And this, this really varies from company to company. Um, you know, in talking to friends of mine at Apple, most of them are sort of more PMM oriented, more product marketing um, and go to market oriented on the product side. At LinkedIn, it's far more business analyst heavy. And so you really are, are um, sort of even more than informed, you're data driven in a lot of the product decisions that you make. And this varies from company to company. And so I will share that as context that the role is highly malleable and you do have to be flexible. So what does product not do? They definitely don't art direct uh, designers. If uh, a product manager stands over the shoulders of a designer and says, this really should be orange, not red, uh, it's not gonna go well. And so you, you definitely want to uh, enable and facilitate them to do their craft and not be sort of uh, what I like to call swooping and, and pooping uh, on their designs. You don't want to be prescriptive with engineering. So if you're giving engineering a blueprint and telling them what to go build, especially if you uh, are not technical, that is the fastest path to organ rejection, uh, at least in companies that are very engineering centric. So you do want to work with them, both engineering and design are your thought partners uh, when you're building a product. They're not service organizations. As a PM, you definitely don't want to come down off the mountain with a solution. So uh, when PMs come down off the mountain and say, here's the solve that is going to, uh, you know, take the company to the next level, it usually doesn't go well. And again, it's not inclusive of your design, your engineering and your data partners when you're building products. So be very, very careful uh, about taking that role on. They're not idea generators. So when the team starts to become a receptacle for ideas and you're basically as a product manager, just tossing things over the fence and saying, go build this, it's not sustainable. It oftentimes leads to a lot of churn and thrash for the team. And it doesn't, again, uh, sort of facilitate a, an inclusive model for your product, uh, or I'm sorry, for your engineering, your design and your data counterparts. And then lastly, 
Product managers are not many CEOs. I've heard this thrown around uh, quite often, even at previous companies that I've worked at. Like, hey, what's the conception or the the role of a product manager? Um, and when I hear many CEOs, I get very, very nervous. It's not a dictatorial post. Uh, in fact, it's kind of the opposite. Um, when you're doing it really, really well, you're sort of enabling and facilitating the team. Uh, and then as you sort of grow in your role and uh, you know, start managing product managers, you're oftentimes editorializing, right? And helping guide them and putting guide rails on uh, where things are going for the team. Um, but it's more editorial and curative uh, in nature uh, than it is dictatorial. So if you are sort of taking the the path of like, hey, I'm the mini CEO, uh, I've, I've seen it work in the short term, but it's certainly not sustainable in the long term, in my opinion. So PMs should definitely know the company mission, uh, vision, and oftentimes core user value proposition. I, I oftentimes hear this third uh, piece left out. I just hear about the mission and the vision. But you do want to know uh, and be able to articulate what the value proposition is to the end user, to your customer. Um, and the product should flow from that, right? Like whatever you're trying to achieve as a company, the product should line up to facilitating and enabling that for your users. So uh, an example of this is, is Google, right? Like to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. I don't think this has changed in over 20 years now. Um, and it has been their guiding light and their beacon for how they build products. And even when they would make acquisitions, so when they bought Keyhole, which later became Google Maps, uh, when they bought YouTube, they viewed those products as search problems, right? And they were like, well, you know, these are large bodies of content and people are trying to navigate this. They're trying to find a particular video. They're trying to find a particular destination. And what enables that? Search. So this has informed so many pieces of their roadmap. And even when you look at things like Android, Android still is very tangentially related to search because by definition, you need control over your destiny, right? And if people are searching on on iPhone, that could be existential to Google's existence, right? Because eventually Apple or some other player could usurp uh, Google's position as the search leader. Facebook, this has changed. Uh, I know a couple of years ago they updated this, but they largely just augmented and extended uh, this mission. But for many, many years, well over a decade, uh, it was to make the world more open and connected. And all of the products, right, from from Facebook places to uh, Facebook groups uh, to the newsfeed was all about making the world more open and connected. I can tell you when I got to Twitter, uh, we kept pivoting on what the value proposition was. And when I first got there, it was all about lightweight identity. We wanted to be your public profile on the internet. Um, and then later it changed to events and being sort of real time events in the world. Um, so if you remember back in 2011, 2012, they were doing those huge campaigns around hashtag NASCAR um, in the US. And uh, it was all about that. That was the theme of the moment. And then it became, hey, Twitter brings you closer. Um, and then by the time I was leaving, uh, we had pivoted again to the global town hall where the conversation happens, right? And so this becomes very tricky uh, if you can't articulate your value proposition. Um, and I'm not saying that this is the case for Twitter now. I've been gone for a long time, but at least when I was there, it made it more difficult to know, hey, which direction is the coast? And then you can point your boat uh, you know, accordingly. But if you don't know where the coast is, it becomes more difficult to manufacture and, and create a blueprint for the products you want to build. Same problem at Pinterest. Uh, when I first got there, it was a discovery engine. That was sort of how we labeled it and articulated the value proposition. Um, and then later we pivoted to a tool for inspiration. Um, and then later it became a visual bookmarking tool. And then lastly, by the time again, I was leaving in 2016, we had pivoted to this concept of catalog of ideas, um, which is really, if you think about it, just a discovery engine uh, again. So we had kind of come full circle. Um, and so this again, sort of makes it more difficult and opaque to know which way you should be pointing when you're building products. So let's talk a little bit about what PMs are accountable for. First and foremost, you really, really want to understand the competitive landscape in which you exist. And that's industry-wide because oftentimes um, competitors will come out of nowhere and you don't even realize that you're competing with them until it's too late. Um, so an example of that is 
you know, in the very early days of uh, Twitter, when I was working on the API, we didn't really see Instagram as competitive to us. We actually saw them as highly complimentary. They were pumping imagery uh, into the system. We were rendering it for users in the feed and we thought they were highly complimentary from a platform perspective. What we didn't realize though, was that uh, imagery and the visual na nature of the interface for Instagram uh, was going to overtake text on the phone and uh, you know, imagery rich media is just far more engaging uh, and, um, you know, expressive, if you will, uh, um, than text. And, and you're seeing this again with video today, uh, overtaking imagery. Um, and so yeah, it sort of helps define or, or at least explain the rise of TikTok. So you really want to have an understanding of not just who your competitors are today, but where the landscape of the industry is going. As a PM, you really want to be able to pull together uh, executive and cross-functional context um, to, into a holistic and complete narrative that you can then share and rebroker to the rest of the org so that people have the bigger picture, right? Oftentimes, you know, legal is operating over here and um, user operations is over here and uh, design might even be down here. Um, and you're all seeing different pictures of the elephant, right? But it's framed uh, with certain context. And oftentimes that context is just a piece of the puzzle. So part of your job, an incredibly important part of your job is making sure you pull together the entire picture of the elephant that you can then recirculate to the rest of the org so that people have full transparency and context into the decisions that are being made. And that's going to make your life much, much easier uh, when it comes time to have alignment around future decisions. Definitely take the time to delve into user research and build a sense of empathy uh, for your users. Uh, this is really, really important. Um, I spend, for instance, at Reddit, a lot of times chatting with moderators. And um, before this whole uh, COVID and shelter in place thing kicked off, I was really excited because we were, every year we do these things called mod road shows where we go out and we actually meet people. It's almost like a concert event. Um, and we'll meet in local cities, a lot of the moderators who help us facilitate uh, Reddit communities. And this is just a really important part of the job. I used to do this at Pinterest as well. We would get together with folks in the cooking space, with folks in the DIY space and the fashion space um, and really understand how are they using the product, how are they using the tool that you're building for them? Uh, be globally minded from the outset. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier when I went back to venture uh, that I spent a lot of time in uh, East Asia. Um, I've spent time doing research uh, with users in Europe. I've spent time in uh, Latin America. Like things differ, right? When I, I remember when I spent time in China trying to understand the consumer landscape there, mobile had totally, like they had skipped the desktop altogether. They'd gone straight to the mobile phone. It was a largely cashless society. So folks were just using, uh, you know, WePay and Alipay. So their mobile phone was literally their wallet. Um, and the really interesting thing is that apps are like super apps there. They serve many, many different functions. Whereas in the US and in the West, uh, we, we have more sort of functional, almost microservice-like applications where one app does one thing really, really well in, at least in China, there's just a few apps that do many things uh, really, really well. Um, and, you know, furthermore, uh, you start to learn about how the businesses operate. And so, in, again, in China, it, the, the digital ads market there is highly, highly nascent. So much of the revenue actually comes from users. So users, which is kind of insane to think about, at least in the West, right? We, we sort of build internet services off of uh, the ads world, right? And that's the sort of economic backbone uh, of applications here where, you know, in, in China, digital gifts, uh, you know, virtual goods, those actually drive the bulk of revenue there. So you, you really do want to understand the market if you have aspirations uh, to grow go globally and most companies that I talk to do. So this is also super important. Definitely be able to frame up the user problem. What are you solving for your customer? Uh, one of the things that I often see, especially in PMs that are starting in their careers, they'll go straight to the solution. 
Uh, and oftentimes you're designing solutions according to your own personal biases. And this is a famous problem in the Valley where we sort of operate in a vacuum and we solve problems for people in the Valley. And, and sometimes it works, right? In, in the case of like Uber, uh, San Francisco was horrible to get a taxi cab in uh, if you sort of dial, you know, the clock back to, to 2012, 2013. And so Uber solved that problem. It turned out that hailing rides anywhere from your phone uh, was really useful. But, you know, it tends to be the case that a lot of the problems in your locale don't necessarily translate naturally uh, to the rest of the globe. And so you do really want to understand your customer. You want to get into their head. You want to understand what problems you're solving for them. Once you've framed up very tightly what the problem is that you're solving, at that point, enable design and eng to go solve, uh, you know, and, and create a solution to that problem. You should still be tightly engaged. You want to be a sounding board and a, a thought partner for those, those colleagues, but let them do their discipline, right? They've spent a lot of time uh, honing and enabling their own craft. Really give them, you know, some space to go out and build interesting solutions. Uh, and then when they come back together as a team with you, you know, evaluate and, and, and assess, did we solve the user problem that we set out to go tackle? When they come back with different alternatives and different paths you can take on the solution front, your job as a product manager is really to highlight the, the pros and cons. Help folks understand across the team and also uh, you know, a layer or two above you, what are the trade-offs, right? If we take path A, here's what we can gain, but here's the, the investment, here's the cost. Uh, if we take path B, uh, here's the, the pros uh, and the cons, right? And then pick the ones where you're gonna get the, pick the path where you're gonna get the most return on the investment um, and, and make a very educated decision. And, and that rigor, that due diligence is really the role uh, of the product manager. Additionally, make sure that the, the quality of the decision-making and also the pace of the decision-making happens uh, in a time-bound manner. Like you really, you obviously wanna help the team make good decisions. If you go too far down the path and you realize we screwed up, we didn't make the best decision, uh, you, know, you, have to, you have to take that on the chin as the product manager, that, that responsibility and accountability falls to you. Also the pace of the decision-making, um, you know, not to, to knock on my friends in design, but oftentimes design loves to go out into the forest and get lost and explore a lot. And you have to make sure that they come back at some point because you do have to deliver a good, right? You're still building a business and it's important that you're delighting your customers with, with new products. And so you can't sort of go off and, and wander in the wilderness for too long without coming back and delivering something of value to the users and some, subsequently to your, um, your company. Cross-functional coordination and alignment. Product managers like to go really fast on things, but you have to make sure you're bringing the rest of the team along with you. And that doesn't just mean, by the way, design and uh, you know, engineering and data, um, which are sort of your, your sister disciplines, that also means your extended disciplines, right? Your, your partners on legal, your partners on policy, your partners on user operations, um, your, uh, your partners across the board, right? Marketing. You have to make sure that all of these folks are aligned and coordinated with you. If you go too far down the path and you ask uh, biz dev for something like, hey, I'm, I'm doing this launch it's coming in 48 hours. Can you line up 10 marquee partners to go out in the launch announcement? That's not cool, right? You, you do have to plan ahead. You have to make sure these folks are coordinated. You have to make sure that they're aligned with you on the decision-making. So I like to call this putting the cake dish over the bat phone. You, you want to protect the team. So, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of noise that will come from different directions in the organization's uh, sometimes it comes from the executive staff, right? Like uh, oftentimes people on e-staff will not have the full context that you do. And so uh, they'll sort of come out of nowhere with a seemingly left field request. It's your job to, to go and negotiate that with them, right? Don't just pass that on to engineering and design. Uh, likewise, you know, you might have 
you know, someone from marketing come to you with an objection about a launch and maybe they don't have a full understanding in the full picture. It's your job to go and work on that with them and protect the team and enable them to keep building and not do a stop start or a false start or ultimately thrash them. Define metrics that measure success. So your, your metrics and, and what you're measuring should reflect your strategy and ultimately what you want to achieve. So you do want to make sure um, that you're picking the right metrics. And that, again, is a really critical part of your job as a product manager. Define those metrics, make sure that they are the best proxy to success um, and, and can reflectively show to you, to the team, um, to the executive staff, that your team uh, is doing the right thing for the business. Also ship. Uh, you know, I mentioned a little bit earlier that that time bounding and pace of decision making, you want to make sure that the, the trains are arriving on time, no matter what happens. And when you plan uh, timelines and milestones, things are always going to come up. Uh, you know, we're, we were just battling this with, um, with COVID uh, at Reddit, right? And we had a couple of big launches planned and all of a sudden, we had to go remote. Folks weren't in the office anymore. Uh, the conversations were very high bandwidth. We had to spend a lot more time on Zoom, on Google Hangouts. Uh, we had to start doing virtual daily standups because we weren't getting the same level of uh, interaction at the lunch table or having the hallway conversations and being able to just run over to someone's desk. So things are always going to come up, right? There's always going to be roadblocks and surprises. Your job is to navigate those and get the team over the finish line according to the commitment that you set, right? And if you've ever been to Japan, I always, I love uh, getting on the Shinkansen and it is absolutely delightful when that thing shows up down to the minute. Um, and that's the level of discipline that you should have on your team. Like they are so well coordinated at running those trains on time. You want to have that, that, that level of muscle um, and, and execution uh, discipline on your team. And then I'll just say, you know, one other sort of pattern uh, of behavior that I see in many product managers that I think you should steer away from is uh, what I like to call the shiny object syndrome, right? You'll launch something <clears throat> and then something new and sexy and appealing will come up and you'll say, let's go drive the team over there now. And then this other thing that you just launch, uh, it sort of withers on the vine. Don't do that, right? When you are putting together a product plan and scoping out something uh, to give to your users, take a perspective of a very long game, right? You want to have long horizons out on the distance and have a vision for what that product can, can morph into and evolve into because it, it won't just happen over 90 days, right? You have to give yourself sustained periods of time to evolve it, understand how users are using it, calibrate, uh, you know, reinvent, uh, you know, oftentimes things will fail the first couple of times. But if you have conviction about something that you're delivering to users, you should go back to the drawing board at least once or twice and keep evolving it. Um, you know, if Square, for instance, uh, had just moved away from the Square wallet and said, hey, it didn't work, they wouldn't have the Cash App today. And really the Cash App is just an evolution of, of the Square wallet. So you want to have long horizons and then you want to have many milestones along that, that path, right? But keep a longer term vision and anticipate that some things might take 12, 24, 36 months to get to, but have, have milestones along the way so that the, the team feels a sense of achievement uh, and progress. And then lastly, I'll just share, um, savor the wins, like really take a moment. There are small things that will happen on certain days. They don't always happen often. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can sort of get caught up in, in like this thing is delayed or we just shipped it and there was a miscoordination with the marketing team or this went out and users are, are hating it and, and complaining on Twitter about it. Um, things can, can get often pretty dark uh, when you're in the product role and a lot of people don't don't like to talk about that. Um, but when these little wins come up, like this one, uh, Drake from Canada, uh, you know, made this uh, overconfident tweet that the first million is the hardest. Uh, and then T Boone Pickens, who's an oil man in Texas, uh, said actually the first billion is, is a hell of a lot harder. 
right? And and it was amazing to see this interaction between a pop star uh, and this this oilman uh, and how they were interacting uh, and and joking with each other on Twitter. And I, I remember a few of us <laughs> in the office were laughing about it, and we were like can you believe this, this little thing that, you know, 500 people are working on in San Francisco is being used globally by, you know, these, you know, uh, you know, stars, right? It, it was just a really neat moment. And I, I will never forget that. Um, and just feeling a lot of gratitude for getting to work on this thing that, you know, political debates were unfolding on musicians were, were arguing with each other, uh, you know, athletics, like sports uh, athletes were going, going back and forth debating, like, our team is the best team. No, our team is the best team. It was a really neat experience. And so when these things unfold and it, it happens as a result of the product that you worked on, like really take a moment to savor those wins because that's what it's all about. So thank you very much uh, for taking the time to, to listen to me today. Um, I post a lot of these thoughts and more uh, on my blog. So you're you're welcome to go read more. Um, and my, that's also my handle on Twitter. Um, if you want to ever have continued dialogue there, happy to do it. Um, and at this stage, I will uh, go ahead and, and pause for Q&A. Thank you, Jason, for the amazing insight about product management. So we have a few questions piled up. OK. Would you like to read or should I? Yeah, sure, if you want to read them, just to share them with the rest of the audience, and then I can answer. So we have the first question mm -hmm. from Basil. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing the name wrong. Uh, do you offer ideas or directions first or really leave blank space to think about anything? So I, I leave blank space. Um, I focus heavily on the user problem first and foremost, um, and really try to, you know, bound the specific problem down to a great deal of minutia, both qualitative and quantitative minutia, um, and give that to design and engineering. And if, if there are other product managers on my team, and see what that evokes, um, because I don't want to uh, infect them too early on with my own thoughts and biases. So I try to draw out uh, opinions and, and color commentary from folks on the team. And what I tend to find happens is one of two things. Either I'm not getting uh, close enough to a solve, in which case then I might weigh in with an idea that I have, um, or uh, I'm getting a lot of ideas and then I try to start honing the team down to a specific direction, right? And I try to put guardrails on. But what I have found is if you leave a lot of blank space for the team to contribute, they're far, far more bought in than if you give them sort of a blueprint or a set of your own ideas. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that the people who are crafting the designs and building the engineering solution are heavily bought in at the very beginning. And that really only happens if they feel like they have a, a voice at the table and they're truly a stakeholder in crafting the solution to the user problem. Thank you, Jason. Our second question is from Tamara. Mm -hmm. Regarding the slide about giving space for tech to come up with solutions, yeah. do you think PM with tech background can sometimes hold the back instead of to help? Um, I think it depends on how you use your technical background. Um, you know, this is an area where I like to lean more into my design counterparts because um, design oftentimes has no technical constraints uh, when it comes to their thinking, which I think is a wonderful place to start from. They, they sort of build without any engineering constraints in mind. Um, and then if they bring something that's not necessarily technically feasible, I start to ask engineering, how far can we get here? Like how, how close could we get to this solution that, that design is talking about? And I have that discussion, but I try not to let sort of my own knowledge about, um, you know, how far the technical solution can match up with the design solution. Um, impede 
where we're trying to go as a team. But at some point you do have to reality set, right? You can't ask engineering for a miracle. Where I find the technical uh, background really, really comes in handy is um, uh, it, it does give you an opportunity to call, call bullshit if uh, an engineer is sandbagging on a timeline. And so it is extremely valuable to be able to say like, I don't actually think that that task is going to take four weeks. I think you could do it in three or in two. Um, and so, you know, you just, you have to be careful. It's a double-edged sword, um, you know, use it wisely, help, help to cut through the noise, but also, you know, to the spirit of the question, make sure it doesn't constrain your creativity too much. Thank you. So the third question is from Slavomir. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think that the Reddit environment is a good place to get feedback on a product under development? Uh, I, I, I do. Yeah. I think, I think Reddit and Twitter are great places uh, to get feedback. I kind of treat them uh, almost as like consumer interest groups um, and they will give you feedback. And so, yeah, I oftentimes in, in, my career, um, you know, it, it's, it's a matter of going and kind of understanding and taking it at face value that it is qualitative feedback. So you always want to be able to, you know, at least assuming that there's some product and MVP that's been shipped, you certainly want to be able to look at as much data as you can. And oftentimes in the early days, that's very, very hard because the data is just not there, right? You haven't found product market fit. Um, but if you're exploring ideas and just sort of bandying them about uh, as to whether or not you want to go build something, I do think those are, are great places to kind of just air out like some thoughts and see uh, what people have to say. But you have to take it with a grain of salt because it is qualitative in nature. Um, and, you know, people come to, to the table with their own biases. Thank you. I've, I've just checked on uh, on YouTube. We don't have questions yet. Uh, so, so far, it seems more the, the Zoom crowd is uh, having extra questions. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, so, uh, Murtaza, you know which was the last question, if uh, Jason still wants to take a few more. Sure. So the, next, the next question is again from Slavomir. Do you think that the Reddit environment is a good place to get feedback on a product under development. Have you ever had a case where someone used your services to test the product for potential users? So I don't know about the latter question. Um, I'm sure it has probably happened. Um, if I, if I were to guess, um, I, you know, yeah, I, I do think it's a good place uh, to test concepts and that you can get, feedback uh, on your ideas there. Um, I certainly have seen a lot of that in the crypto space and also the autonomous vehicle space. So those are pretty active communities on Reddit today. And I will see, I like to just lurk in those communities because I'm fascinated by both of those areas. And I do see people go in there uh, and sort of, you know, in the same vein that they do on Hacker News, you know, we'll sort of put uh, conceptual ideas forward and and basically ask the audience to pressure test them and see if there might be an interesting market there. Um, so I, I do think, you know, there there is something there. You know, in terms of someone launching, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I, they probably posted a link to something. We don't have a, you know, a true developer platform on Reddit today. So there might be a world in which you know, later on, you could imagine somebody launching, you know, a product or several products on Reddit um, in a very palpable way and, and being able to procure feedback in real time, um, both from the data perspective and the qualitative perspective. Um, but we don't have that. Uh, so I'm sure people have launched things on there, though, in the same way that they do on like Hacker News and said, hey, this just went live, like, we'd love to, to get feedback. Um, and I, you know, I think it's a great use of, of the service.
Thanks a lot. Let's maybe take one more question and then we we can stop the live stream and uh, go into the uh, hangout. Um, uh, so uh, did we take the question from Sylvie? What are the difficulties now with COVID-19 uh, as, as you for you as a product leader, uh, mm. particularly with stakeholder management as you can meet people in Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it makes the job of product so much harder. I was joking with um, my design counterpart and my engineering counterpart. I was like, this is amazing uh, for you two because you have way more space to just sit down and, and work on your craft. And, you know, a designer might want to like really sit down and go deep on a series of you know visual designs or interaction designs engineering might went you know four five six hours of just you know undisturbed unfettered time to to code and products like it's a very different role it's it's you know hyper extroverted and so you do have to be out there talking to folks all the time so it's it's definitely made my days longer um because I'm spending way more time crafting emails and making sure my communication is really, really tight. I'm spending way more time documenting decisions when they happen and sharing context around why decisions have happened and, and uh, sort of the horse historical reference of how we got to a decision. I'm spending way more time on product specs, um, a lot more time on Zoom to make sure that, that folks are aligned because conversations especially when it comes to, to product are very, very high bandwidth. And so I can just share that I'm not a fan of the working remote. Like I would never want to do the work from home thing. And I'm, I'm dying actually to get back into the office because I love to get, I, I like to be in the tent uh, with, with my, my team. And I like to be able to, you know, spitball ideas in real time, have folks in the room, be able to go to the whiteboard, um, you know, be able to go out to lunch together um, because I do think it, you know, building product is a full contact sport and you, you really benefit from being in the office together, in my opinion. And so I, it has made my job a lot harder and I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting uh, getting back to the office with my, my partners. Thank you so much, Jason. And uh, with this, we will uh, end the live streaming on YouTube. So for the YouTube audience, I've posted a link to Zoom. If you guys want to join from there for the breakout session, uh, if not, then uh, see you next week. And I'm stopping the stream now. Thanks a lot, Jason.